For many years, Steve coordinated the Master Gardener program for the University of Maryland Extension Service in Carroll County. He is a mentor who has inspired many Master Gardeners in Carroll County today. And we're thrilled to have Steve uh, here to, to talk about historic trees in Carroll County, amongst other things. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, besides being the Master Gardener Coordinator, and I think it's been, and I'm gonna rely on Marilyn Phillips as she's in here to confirm this, but oh yeah, she's wandering around doing circles, or Bill Palm. Congratulations, Bill, happy birthday. Um, I also wore the hat, I, I was the Master Gardener Coordinator, which really meant herding a lot of different interests together to be volunteers for the community. Um, but my other role there at Extension was to help homeowners with their plant problems. And um, I always had great things coming across my desk. A lot of things were kind of weird and unusual. Every so often somebody would bring in a black widow or periodically a scorpion. We don't have scorpions in Carroll County except in our produce that comes from the tropics. So once every so often a scorpion would show up. Um, and I got to meet a lot of characters that had perceived problems when in fact they were just not seeing things they should be seeing. But that's okay, I, I was open to lots of questions. Um, the beauty of working at Extension, especially for me, was they kind of let you, as a expert, kind of delve into your own areas um, or own interests, and for me it was always trees. So as I was at Extension, I became a uh, certified arborist and did a lot of educational outreach in regards to trees. So that was uh, my big push. And I recognized a lot of faces of uh, some of the various characters across through my office. So it's good to see you again, including Kevin. <laughs> and Kevin's been a great resource because I, I, that's the first thing I'm gonna tell you and probably reiterate is I'm not a historian, I'm more of a person who likes to see trees reach a certain age, um, but the back history I'm not real good on, but Kevin helped to provide a lot of those details. Typically when I do tree talks, my talks are outside, and a lot of you, or several of you, have been on some of those what I call walks and talks. And hopefully maybe we could do something like that in conjunction with the Historic Society in the city of Westminster, where we could walk around Emerald Hill, and Willis Street and some of the other areas that have significant trees, including McDaniel College. That'll be a big walk. We'll have to do sit series. Actually, my life now, I'm self-employed and I work with uh, primarily two other people. We formed a team and we do environmental consulting for mostly uh, municipal entities, uh, Baltimore County and a couple cities um, in Maryland. Plus, we do a lot of consulting for military bases, primarily the Army, um, on, their, on their bases because they're big land holders. Aberdeen, Edgewood, Fort Meade, um, the underground Pentagon, Fort Detrick, they all have substantial um, forests, and we do a lot of forest studies. Um, some of them are quite strange. We'll, we'll do a uh, study on long-eared bat habitats. I still don't even know what a long-eared bat looks like, but the long-eared bat people didn't know what the trees looked like that they knew they needed, so we would go out and actually do the field assessments. So yeah, this, this, this stand of trees has this type of tree, and it would be good habitat based on your research as to uh, what the bats need. So that's a little bit of my background currently, what I'm doing. And we try to work three days a week. Um, most of the time we stick to that and, and make it in the middle of the week. The gist of my talk is, uh, or part of uh, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is if you have or are interested in preserving trees, start caring for your trees early. And that, um, obviously, you plant a tree, you make sure you water it, and you hug it, and you make sure that you don't overspray it with your lawn weed killers, and you don't whack it with your lawnmower or your weed eater. Um, they're the basic things. But one thing that a lot of people forget is when trees, where do trees naturally grow? This is an easy one. This is a softball I'm throwing out. In the woods. Ah. 
<laughs> in the woods, perfect. And that's actually the picture of my cousin hugging this 51 inch sweet gum. And I couldn't get the whole sweet gum in the picture because it went up 60 feet before you saw the first branches. And had this very tall, and when you look at historic trees around Carroll County, for the most part, they were grown in the open. They weren't grown in the woods. And I liken those trees that are grown into the, in, in the open as it's like feeding a teenager and letting them sit on the sofa 24 hours a day, play video games and eat potato chips. Rather than growing up and competing with all those other trees around them, they just grow out. They don't have to work up to the sun because they got sun all around them and they probably have enough uh, other resources from the, the lawn fertilizers and whatever else get put out. So uh, as historians, and I kind of liken myself to, uh, to a historian, many times we'll be marching around in the woods and all of a sudden we'll be in this group of trees and they're all straight up like that one my, that my cousin was hugging that you haven't seen yet. And they will we'll find a big fat round tree with a big trunk and that's our first clue is, hey, we need to look around. We love looking for arrowheads too. Um, different type of history, I guess. But we uh, usually when we find a big open grown tree, we start poking around and looking for old foundations, for family graveyards, and maybe even for old fence posts. And many times we can come across those things. Um, the other thing, and I find this in every county, um, Carroll, Frederick, Harford, Baltimore County, is every so often we'll find these dead trees, and it's a straight line, and these trees almost grow like bushes, and they're old Osage orange trees. And if anybody's familiar with Osage orange, it's, it was known as bowwood because it, it was highly valued to make uh, bows out of, hunting bows. Um, and this tree was primarily planted, though, by farmers as livestock fence. And if you ever run into an Osage orange tree, they have lots of thorns. But when you see them, this dead row of trees going straight and making a hard right, you realize you're looking at a, a livestock field. And again, then we start going out and looking for um, foundations and old graveyards and things like that. Um, we, we didn't realize that at one point we were at Aberdeen Proving Grounds and we saw this row of Osage Orange old row going down and then pretty soon we found some old foundations, but they were big. And how many people knew that the original Baltimore was up at Aberdeen, Baltimore City? It, it, was, it was on, um, it was quite far into the base, right along the bay and they had to abandon it. Um, it was, they realized it was a mistake. It was too shallow there. Um, but you can still see the foundations of the, um, of the courthouse or the church. I think it doubled as both. Um, and I believe there's some old graveyards in that area. We, we found something that looked like an old graveyard. Um, okay, now that we're skating along here. <laughs> okay, that's about historic. We talked about the categories legal, working, and what, these are my categories. You all can look at it differently. Most people, I haven't heard anybody else call it this way, but some of the times when we're walking through the woods, we joke and we say, oh, that's a line oak or a, a legal tree, or it's a working tree, it belonged in a fence, or I'll show you later on, it stops golf balls. Um, but this is a picture of the um, trees, the three, white oaks that run next to Tahoma Farm Road on the Wakefield Valley property. And actually, if you beat your way back into the bush, the two of the remaining trees, if you look at the trunks, you can see barbed wire was running through the, the, in, in through the tree. So I'm quite sure it was also a working tree. One side of that, um, that tree was probably a pasture for livestock, horses, cattle, I'm not real sure. My reoccurring theme, and it's written here, is unfortunately trees die. I went to take pictures of other line oaks in Carroll County, the Brawnings that live um, down off of uh, Deer Park. I remember seeing a whole bunch on their property, I stopped by to see Kate, and they were all gone. Unfortunately, trees do die. So 
That's why some of the times I tell people, if you want a memorial, be careful because they will eventually die. And one of my arguments I'll present later is maybe we should plant collections of trees rather than one tree with one plaque. Uh, more pretty pictures. These are just close-ups of the three trees that were in Tahoma Farm Road. I'll use my laser pointer that can burn a hole in a wallet. Um, this is the one dead tree. When I measured it, it was, it was 60 inches around. And a lot of times people say, how do you know how old a tree is? Well, we understand certain trees grow slowly and certain trees grow quickly, but conditions dictate a lot of the growth. And there are people called dendrochronologists that will look at a cross section or a cross cut on a tree. They call it a biscuit, where they'll count the rings, but they don't just count the rings. They can also measure how well a tree was doing historically by how far apart those rings are. When there's more resources, and the big resource for most trees is sun and moisture, and in dry years, that one resource, water, if it's, or water, depending on where you're from, if that's limiting, then you'll notice the growth rings are very tight. Um, so, but I know these are all oak trees, and in general, most of the white oaks, you will get about 10 rings per inch. So looking at a 60 inch tree, I can do a quick calculation and say, oh, on average, there's probably, third, you, you, you have that diameter, that 60 inch diameter, you have it, I should say diameter like this, and that gives you 30 inches, 30 times 10 means that that was probably a 300 year old tree. So it's a guesstimation. Otherwise, you can take this interesting, basically it's a drill, but it's a hollow tip, and you put it in the tree. You slowly crank this thing so that it taps itself into the tree, and you do a little biopsy. You basically pull out a core of the tree, and you can count the rings that way. Um, again, something like that. This, when I put it together, this is only about 16 inches long, and it will um, only pull out 16 inches worth of a 30 inch half diameter that I want to get a hold of. So you have to do a little guessing then on what the rest of that would have shown me. Ah, the other example, McDaniel College, formerly Western Maryland College. These were planted back in the 1960s because one of the holes on the golf course as you're coming into the clubhouse, this, these three trees run along Pennsylvania Avenue were planted back in the, they think the late 60s, or early 70s. There were people that I talked to that argued about it um, to block the golf balls. They're relatively fast growing trees and they form a wide vase habit. Um, they probably came from Carroll Gardens. This is one of, oh, Katsura tree, that's it. Katsura tree, which is an unusual Asian species. So when I find something like this in a landscape, I know that was planted on purpose. And this, these, after asking some questions with people in the know, they said, yeah, back in the end of the 60s, they wanted to make sure the golf balls weren't hitting cars and houses across the street. Not that many went that far, but that's why they planted these trees. So in a sense, this is a working tree. It's stopping golf balls. If you ever need a big shade tree, I would say get a Katsura tree but I kind of was biting at my words as I was taking pictures because these three trees, which are beautiful, this last tree seems to have um, a good bit of decline. So I don't know what's going on. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and I'm not blaming the golf course, is every so often golf courses need heavy chemical management to control funguses and control weeds. And maybe if you're spraying, spraying for weeds on a, a slightly windy day or a day that's too warm, that chemical can drift and what I say is ding the tree or uh, cause the tree to die back a little bit. So hopefully this will re recover. I'm not sure, I'm only guessing at that. And this is just a pretty picture or close up of that Katsura tree. Okay, and this was, I talked about this earlier. We were walking through the woods. This was in Baltimore County, and I've seen this in Carroll County and in Frederick County, and we're doing our inventory, and all of a sudden it's like, what's this hedge? And I realized they're all just dead Osage orange trees that some farmer who had livestock, he wanted to keep 
and plant them real tight. Or you can't even walk through these dead ones. They're so tightly planted together. The other beauty of this is like locust, the wood does not, or it rots very slowly. So these, this stand, we're guessing, if we looked at the historic documents, was um, they were probably about 100 to 120 years old, somewhere in that area. So again, as if you're in the woods and you start to see something like that where all these trees line up, we start snooping around. And in time, we did find a foundation. It was pretty caved in, but it was still there. Ah, religious and memorial trees. How many people have been up to the, uh, what's it, the Emmanuel Lutheran Church in, in Manchester? Yeah, this is a great looking tree. Um, it has that, that perfect crown crown. I'm gonna tell you at the end of this, you need to resist that. Everybody loves to see it, but it can get quite expensive. Um, and this particular tree, they think is probably close to 300 years old. It's an old tree. I would visit it within the next 10 years. Um, I, I noticed when I was taking pictures, there's some dieback right here, which isn't unusual to see dieback because the, um, there's a, a lot of heat pressure that's reflecting off the church. And that side of the tree also hangs over the asphalt or the cattle, if you want to call it that. And again, there's an impervious surface, so that's going to limit water, especially that side of the tree. And also, you're going to get a lot of reflected heat off, the, uh, off that driveway. Um, okay, which one am I using? The great thing about it is they recognize this as being a valuable historic tree, and they've taken the time to record some of the information from the churches and where the, there were, I think there's been a total of three churches, including the one in the picture that have been at that site. And they've recorded the history of the tree since it's been there. They know that, or they believe it actually had been a field that had been burned by native populations, but there's some arguments over whether that really happened. But this oak tree, that's the beauty of an oak tree, is it can withstand a lot of fire damage. And that is one reason why many of our woodlands are no longer oak woodlands, because we don't allow wildfire to run through many areas. And not too long ago, we had something run through where? Not in Baltimore County, off the River Valley Ranch. Well, it, it, River Valley Ranch, but Soldier's Delight just a couple weeks ago, and that's, uh, they, they count on having burns, and I don't know what the real story is if they haven't, they, they've had these controlled burns over the years, but obviously it was drying up this spring and enough fuel load was on the ground, meeting dead branches and trees that you had this fire. A tree like this would probably live through that fire, well, maybe not quite like this, maybe a little younger, uh, would live through that fire because oak trees tend to withstand a lot of burn pressure. The other thing, if you have a historic tree or a tree of interest, you'll probably want to install what's called a lightning protection system. And that's what that, that white covering is. It's actually insulation that's covering a metal cable that goes to the top of the tree. This is not a do-it-yourself project. You want to have an arborist come in and look at the tree and then install the system because they can figure out some of the best protocol or the best places to, to place those uh, that, that um, the, the wire within the crown so that if there is a strike, it's safely uh, taken to the ground rather than through the tree. Um, several years ago when I was working for Extension, um, the county had called me and said, hey, we know you like trees. We have some questions on these black oak trees that run down Old Westminster Pike starting kind of, uh, what is that? I guess where 97 comes in the Main Street, but old, Heading east on Old Westminster Pike, there are a series of black oaks that were planted in um, 1919, July 4th, 1919, as a matter of fact, according to the uh, sign, that were memorial trees for the first soldier killed, the American soldier killed in World War I, or at least that's the way I understand the story. Um, what's great is, Kevin, five years ago, I think you were the catalyst to help kind of bring back the memory of Jerome uh, Day. And they had a planting at Emerald Hill 
and there's still plaque in the ground. It's, I think it's a white oak that was planted about five years ago. So um, if you have a chance, it's worth visiting Emerald Hill. As I said earlier, it, it possesses a lot of significant trees. Maybe not all of them have historic significance, but a couple of them do. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we planted about, um, let's see, 2014, when I was on the tree commission, um, the Babylon tree on Willis Street, which we'll look at later, um, was turning to what they thought was about 250 years old. And we planted what was known as a Sester Centennial oak at Emerald Hill, which is supposedly a seedling off of that oak on, at the Babylon Estate or house on Willis Street. Um, it's still a wee lad or we, I guess I shouldn't gender it, should I? It's still a wee tree. It's maybe about 12 foot tall, but doing well. Uh, lastly, in Westminster, um, the Women's Club, was it? Yeah, the Women's Club, um, the Federated Club, back in the Bicentennial, planted a wide oak cutting. And I'm fortunate because I live very close to Belgrove Square where it's planted, and I've been looking at it over the years. I'm a bit worried, and a lot of people who planted um, wide oak cuttings have noticed that the tree has um, an unusual habit in that early on in its years, it tends to split, not physically the trunk splits, but two leaves form. And that, for a tree, like I said, a lot of those trees in the woods have a straight trunk and then the crown comes out. But when it splits, all of a sudden, as the tree grows, that split doesn't move up. That split stays right where it splits and you get more and more load on each of those arms splitting off, or you could have three splits. Um, so far, there aren't many of these trees that have split apart, but hopefully in time, somebody will look at it just to assess its overall health. The other worry is that um, this particular tree, if you look at the trunk in this picture, especially in that area, it looks a little fuzzy, and that fuzziness is a stress response and that means that the tree is probably under some unusual stress and you start to see leaves coming off in areas that you don't associate with leaves. They, they go along the branches or along the trunk, you'll see leaves popping out. I think it's a stress response to what um, is a minor disease. So in time, this should grow out of it if I'm correct. And so far this year, it looks good, nice and healthy, well-leafed or well-covered. Kevin's familiar with this. This is right on Willis Street. This is the Babylon Oak. Unfortunately, I don't have other pictures of it. There's lots of great stories about it. It's been around probably, what, 300 years? Easily. This is a massive tree. And somewhere in my memory and Kevin's memory, we both have seen pictures of when this tree was being worked on. We think in the 20s or 30s, it had a cavity. And there's an image of a guy actually filling this cavity with concrete, with either block or concrete. I can't remember it myself. But that was the kind of the science at that time. Now when you have a cavity, you don't fill it up. Actually, if, if you are making cuts on your tree or your tree has a split, the advice is not to paint it with a tree wound paste, but to let the tree kind of heal itself. And trees don't heal like we do, where we grow new t tissue. Trees heal by growing bark and, and tissue around the wound and isolating the wound. So it, they call it compartmentalizing. They don't regrow tissue. They just wall off tissue that's damaged. And that's actually survived amazingly well. It's obviously in its waning years. If you drive by, I couldn't get the whole canopy, but there's many dead branches. I know Kevin and the family are probably trying to flip a coin to decide when to remove it. Um, so I'll leave that up to you guys. Ah, Emerald Hill, I already mentioned. These are a couple of the champion trees that are recognized, except for the middle picture. We had a gathering um, I, since I was on the Tree Commission, there was a gathering and a commemorative tree was planted with all the Democrats in Carroll County because <laughs> this was for Neil Ridgely, who just recently passed away. So all the Democrats, including Don West, who gave a short talk and read from um, the Lorax 
Um, we all helped to plant the tree, and it was kind of a nice service, but there are many, many, many memorial trees, and I just happened to participate in the most recent one. And it had, um, quite literally, all the Democrats in Carroll County were there, about <laughs> maybe eight of us, I'm guessing. <laughs> so. Okay, um, this was not in Carroll County, although it could have been. Um, we were doing a survey on a military base and they weren't real sure, but they thought there was a historic site back there. And as we walked back, we started to see these lines of dead little shrubby Osage oranges and they went in straight lines for 200 yards and they ended in the bay. And sure enough, as we started looking around and we picked some leaves out of the way, we found these walls. And the walls were great because we figured this was a barn. We, we got the corner and it was a good sized barn, but then we found cut uh, granite blocks. So somebody, there are no stones that typically occur at Aberdeen. It's rare to find even a pebble. Um, but when we found cut granite stones, we knew that was somebody who had had money because these were big stones. It was a lot to get these stones back there. And actually then when we reported this to the historian on base, they said, oh yeah, okay, that matches up with the map. I said, gosh, I thought we'd found something new, but we just confirmed their suspicion at least. So again, it was really one of those things, once you develop an eye for it, you'll start to see, oh, here's a tree with a big crown in the middle of the woods, but everybody else is all straight up and down. What's the story behind this tree? And then we start looking around and usually you can uncover what caused that. It was many times man-made or man-affected years ago. Uh, more pretty, pretty pictures. I've already shown this tree on the left. This is a big um, Tilia Americana or uh, an American, um, what's a common name for Tilia? Linden, American Linden. And then I'm a little suspicious and the guy in the back, Robert Lemieux, I'm going to put on this, but there are two gigantic chestnut oaks on Main Street at McDaniel College. They're massive you don't typically see chestnut oaks this big. And I got a story from two people that there were, these oaks were slated to be cut down by one of the, the, one of the first presidents or during one of the first presidents of Western Maryland College's tenure. And there was some argument and they argued to keep these two chestnut trees because they were already very large. So I'd love to get the history on it, but I really don't know what it is, but they are. Oh, you're pointing at somebody else, Robert. You know what? You're probably right. <laughs> I'll see what I can find. I, I, I don't know the story, but I'll see what I can find. Yeah, and I, I also would like to find out about, about those stones behind Harrison House with just first names on it. Dogs. That's what I figured. At first I said, maybe they're horses, but... Reese Snyder dogs. Oh, really? Yeah, of the Reese Snyders. Reese Snyder as was Carol. Okay. That was the second beach diver. They had a lot of dogs. They buried them all the time. Wow. And that was, they really liked their dogs if they had stones like that. That's impressive. That's true because I heard it from Ann Reese Diver. It's the last person to live in that. From the horse's mouth. That's good. <laughs> Good, well that, that mystery is resolved. Okay, this gets back to my last point, or one of the points that I started with, is I think, and we've watched a lot of big storms come through, um, I think that a, we need to start looking at not just planting the memorial tree, but putting in groups of trees. I mentioned that we did at Wakefield, or the, the city has done at Wakefield Valley, planted the 22 acres in trees. And we know there's lots of environmental benefits to having trees. Um, but areas like this were planted years ago, and now we have a nice little recreational park that has a good bit of shade and has a lot of significant trees. But the thing that I like about this, especially in light of these storms, is trees like this in groups tend to share the load or the brunt of the storm and you have less loss or less significant loss from most storms when you have groups of trees. And you see this time and time again where a developer will cut it, come in and leave a couple big trees. And those are the trees that get hammered by the wind because all their buddies that helped share the load have been removed. 
So if we can, maybe we start should, should start looking to planting groups or blocks of these trees in memory of or, or whatever we want to call it. Um, and not too long ago, now it's getting longer ago, almost 10 years ago, we had that tremendous ice storm in Westminster. I was crazy. When it first started, I woke up in the middle of the morning, well, three o'clock, and I heard those limbs breaking. I went out with my hard hat and started taking pictures because I wanted to see why certain trees were failing from this ice load. And most of the failures, limb breakage, and even trees being toppled over was because of structural defects. And you can probably recognize, this was uh, up at, near Lindy McNulty's house near the college. Uh, this is in front of the old, well, now it's, it's the city office building, I guess. What do we call that? Administrative office. Administrative office building. That was the, uh, one of those three clump. Um, That's right, Birch uh, trees. Yeah, Birch. I can't even remember where this is, but it was just a mess. It was a mess to begin with structurally. A tree was, had poor, poor form. Um, okay, so I talk about taking care of the trees and trying to form them early. It's very easy to do that with a young six, eight, even 10 foot tall tree with just a, a pair of these cheap hand pruners. Actually, these are kind of expensive, but you can do it with even cheap hand pruners. And the idea behind this is with most trees, not all trees, but most trees, their structure is stronger if they have one central leader. And as I said, we plant a lot of our trees in the open, they tend to grow several kind of trunks. And what you can do when they're young is that after pruning shows what was removed from that tree to produce the, the uh, central leader. And every couple of years you could go out and actually do this to your young tree, just remove a couple of branches. And by the time it gets taller, hopefully it will have that natural form and structure what will continue on with that one central trunk. This is behind the Walmart years ago in Westminster, and I looked at that, that tree uh, right here, and I said, oh my God, that looks terrible. One half of the tree is hanging out over the rail, or over the road in front of the, uh, the post office, the new post office. And I looked, and this crack, it was a windy day, and I wish I had a video, as the wind blew, you could see light through the crack. This tree was slowly splitting itself in ha half. And that gets back to my worry about that white oak at Belgrove Square. Now, an ash tree like this would have probably been killed by the emerald ash borer, which many of our ash trees are either dying or have already been killed unless they're being treated. Um, or uh, it would have fallen apart before that. Uh, this is actually a live demonstration not that anything's moving, but this is a demonstration of one cut that was made to keep this tree healthy. And basically this, this branch that's coming off right here, this was cut away. See that top branch? One cut. You can see these two leaves are developing. If somebody had gone back when this tree was six foot tall and just said, hey, I'm gonna just cut away with this pruning shears very easily, that one lead that's diverging. And they could have done eeny, meeny, miny, mo. They're about the same size. I'm quite sure when I was younger, they were the same size. Um, they could have easily done it with a hand pruner. Right now, that tree is a complete loss. Actually, they, fortunately, Walmart removed it once this, they were notified and, and got rid of that hazard. So with this tree, all they did was snap off that second lead, left this on, and this little branch right here is that lead from five years before. And you can see how much smaller it is. I think I'm losing my juice here. You can see how much smaller it is, but this tree now has a strong central trunk, and that's all it took was one snip. So I think that's where I'm leaving you. Oh, again. Stay away from your weed eaters up against the tree, and also watch your lawn weed killers or brush killers because it's just as easy to kill a non-target plant such as a desirable tree or hurt it as it is to kill the weed you want to kill. And I already talked about resisting that by forming a strong central trunk. Any last questions? Yes, Lynn.
Yes, cabling it. Um, I do, but I also ask people, how deep are your pockets? Because as you probably know, it isn't cheap. And Kevin and many other people here who have old trees that are taking care of your trees, as time goes and maybe there's a structural pro problem, you'll need to hire somebody to run those cables in. And they're expensive because they need to come back periodically because the tree, those lines don't go up with those branches. They stay in one point. So as the branch gets older, 10, 15 years, you're gonna to need to invite that person back who will ask for money to put in cables higher. And there's a black mulberry right off Giss Road, probably the oldest black mulberry in the, at least in Maryland, it's an oddball tree. And it, uh, uh, what was it, Bartlett Tree Service, they said, oh my God, we've been there so many times. We've, there's gotta be 14 to 16 cables in the tree. I'm quite sure that cost a good bit of money, so. <laughs> you got a lot of years left. You've been kissing John Waters. So. <laughs> Sorry, Lynn. <laughs> yes. Um, we recently at um, Hyde Creek meeting, we planted a white oak, young white oak, in memory of Bill Town. But um, what I was wondering, it's about, I would say, probably eight to ten feet tall. Yeah. And small around, but it's got lots of little baby branches coming out. I'm wondering, should those be taken away? Because we don't, I mean, it's going to be a specimen tree. Yeah. Uh, the earlier you prune it, the better. And she had asked about a white oak that they plant at Pipe Creek. They're, it's getting a lot of care there, Pipe Creek uh, Meeting House. But ideally, the small little branches that are on the bottom of the tree, you want to trim them out and slowly elevate them. The key. Young trees can take a lot more pruning than an older tree. That, that tree at the uh, uh, Lutheran Church in Manchester, pruning's gonna be hard, especially if you remove a large branch because it takes energy, which an older tree doesn't have as much of, and it takes a lot of time to close over a big wound, whereas a small tree has a lot of vigor, and pruning off those little suckers at the base will add vigor to the top. Yeah, a lot. yeah, and those, if you leave them on, some of those branches in time will start to occupy um, the space and maybe steal some energy. And that's the whole idea in that structural pruning that I talked about is all you're doing is you're redirecting the energy of the tree. You're saying, hey, I don't want these two leads. I want the energy to stop. So you cut it there. It doesn't, some of the times it takes several years to stop it from jumping out, especially on an older tree. The other thing is if you prune a tree and you get a lot of sprouts, and some people call them water sprouts or spouts coming off near the wound site, habitually we've been told, and habitually we prune out those, those little things that shoot up, but they're finding in research, it's good to hold on to those for several years because that's actually facilitating that healing process or that compartmentalization process, they're coming out at that point to, in theory, or they think it's helping to supply that area with energy to help produce that callus or, or wound wood. It'll help the tree then heal from that cut. So in time, you can remove those, but don't keep shearing those back. You're actually limiting the healing process by doing that, if that makes sense. Yes? I did. <laughs> I know that you were part of the project. I'd like to know how they will be pruned given the resources of the city. Well, the beauty of planting that way is it's a dense planting, and it's almost like planting a woodland. Those trees will, first of all, we, don't, we aren't planting landscape trees, but because they're going to be coming neighbor to neighbor, they will be growing in and shading each other. And that effect, that effect of, of your partner shading you redirects the energy up. So most of those trees are gonna have tall, the ones that live, none of them, not any planting that I've seen has 100% survival. That's built into the planting. You're gonna have some loss. But because of that side neighbor shading, 
most of those trees should have relatively straight trunks. Some of those species that were planted aren't going to be big trees and are kind of designed to fade away, but they're there to grab the footprint so that as seedlings then naturally come in, they'll have to race up and grow straight. Some are going to be, some of the species I notice are shorter species, that's fine, but they're going to be taking up the space or the footprint so everybody can grow up naturally and hopefully relatively straight. But that's a good question, how, how we won't have to, or they or whoever is responsible won't have to do pruning. So, yeah. Yes, Jim. Uh, I assume you're aware of the tree planting that went on a couple of years ago out of Singleton property. A little bit, yes. I think that about 300 trees, I think. Yeah, on those upper fields. Just, I, I, don't know, I don't know anything about it, I don't know what they planted, but I just know they did. Yeah, I've talked with uh, Jason Scullion and a couple of other people out at the uh, Singleton Matthews Farm. And actually, I went out and helped them lay it out and talked about what species should be mixed in there. And from what they said, it's, they've been very happy with it. The nice thing about that tree planting is it's a twofer in that not only are you getting trees in your environment, but Carroll County has an unusual law that as you develop, you either have to replant areas with trees where you can buy what's a tree bank and they're going to have that and perpetually in a tree bank that will then provide the college with some money. But it's something like you were talking about, a, a dense. Exactly, yeah, that one I think was planted with 15 foot apart, which is very dense. And of course, some of them are gonna die, but I've heard it's been pretty successful. It's passed all the criteria and now it's officially in a tree bank too, so. Yeah, it seemed like it was a, a real good planning and, a, and not an easy spot to get to, at least. <laughs> yeah, it had a good hill, if I remember. Any last questions? Ah, go ahead. I'm sorry? Oh, yes. We imported it, and we imported it from Asia. <laughs> Um, it's, it's all over. If there's any consolation, we've exported some problems to other people. <laughs> the codling moth is, is in Europe, and the locust tree is evidently a problem in, in parts of, uh, I think, Central Europe. It's, it's, uh, we, and we've virtually ruined the French grape industry with a, uh, a little insect, a phylloxera. Yeah, I had one in the backyard. Oh, you had an ash? Yeah, and then... Wow. Yeah, ash is a great hardwood. It's a real survivor in landscapes. It has generally good natural form, like you said. It grew very straight. Pin oaks is, is the same way. It almost always grows straight. And the branches, they were maybe 12 feet up. Yeah. Yeah, and that and really that's it's a good point though that you, you're kind of brushing up against in that if we do plant trees, we don't want to plant one genus and one species. We want diversity, and it, it's hard to get away from that because we get used to a certain tree and it grows well and behaves well, but you don't know what we're going to import. And we are now in the land of trade. Everything's coming in. Even during the pandemic, I, all I could watch were Amazon and FedEx trucks going up and down the streets delivering things. And I know we're going to import another potential problem in the future. It's just been our history. So. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It was cheaper, fast growing. 
No. Yeah, exactly. So now, and, and there's some crossbreeding programs. We're looking at some risk, uh, um, resistant varieties to the emerald ash borer, but I think it's still kind of early to predict what's going to happen with that. If, if it will be as successful as maybe the chestnuts come back. So we'll have to wait and see. Well, Lynn, thank you.